Hey everybody, Joe here from Avalon. And when people think about tax planning, they might conjure up images of offshore bank accounts in the Cayman Islands or holding companies in the Isle of Man. Now, while there might be a hint of truth to those strategies, they're not appropriate for 99.99% of Canadian business owners. In this video, we're gonna dive into the real tax planning strategies that you can use as a small business owner in Canada. Now these strategies escalate in cost and risk as we go, so really buckle up. So all that and nothing else coming right up. All right, so level one, RSPs and TFSAs. The first level of tax planning is fairly common, but it is still an excellent way for business owners to save tax and save for their retirement. We're talking about registered retirement savings plans or RSPs and tax-free savings accounts or TFSAs. Business owners can use RSPs and or TFSAs to help them save money for the future. Any business owner should look at these first if they wanna reduce the amount of tax that they're paying. They're low cost and very low risk strategies. RSPs and TFSAs are ingrained into our tax system, so are unlikely to be going anywhere in the near future. All right, so what's the difference between RSPs and TFSAs? So RSPs are registered retirement savings plans and TFSAs are tax-free savings accounts. They're both excellent savings methods but have different tax implications. With an RSP, you get a tax deduction when you make the contribution. So this means you pay less tax in the current year that you make that contribution. So that's a good thing. The money inside the RSP will also grow tax-free until you withdraw it in retirement. When you withdraw the money from the RSP, you pay tax on that money at your marginal rate for that particular year. If you're not sure what your marginal tax rate is, you can check out the article linked in the description below for how to calculate that. All right, so here's a quick recap of RSPs. One, you get a tax deduction when you make the contribution. Two, your investments grow tax-free inside that RSP. And three, funds are taxed when you withdraw that from your RSP. All right, so let's move on to TFSAs. So with a TFSA, you don't get a tax deduction when you make a contribution. This means there's no actual tax saved in the current year. Instead, the money inside the TFSA grows tax-free until you withdraw it. When you withdraw funds from your TFSA, you don't pay tax on the withdrawal like you would with an RSP. So here's the TFSA recap. Number one, there is no tax deduction when you make that contribution. Two, your investments grow tax-free inside the TFSA. And number three, funds are not taxed when you withdraw them later. So both TFSAs and RSPs are great savings vehicles, but depending on your situation, one option might be better than the other. Now, this is a simplified way of looking at things, but you can help make the choice between investing in your RSP or TFSA. If you think that you will be in a lower tax bracket when you retire than you are now, an RSP is probably the better choice. If you think you'll be in a higher tax bracket when you retire than you are now, a TFSA is probably the better way to go. So if you're not sure, you can always use both. Now, there are other factors that go into this decision, like how much RSP and TFSA contribution room that you have and how long you plan on saving the money before you need it. It's worth having a chat with an accountant or financial planner if you're not sure what to do. All right, so another common tax planning strategy is to incorporate your business. And this is the sweet spot for most tax planning for business owners. Incorporating gives you access to lower small business corporate tax rates, which allow you to reinvest funds back into your business and build wealth. Now, the chances that the government will remove these benefits of incorporating is pretty small. However, the government has curtailed some of the benefits like income splitting and investing inside your corporation in the last few years. So incorporation is still a safe and effective tax planning strategy as it aligns well with the government's objectives, which are to grow the economy through business growth and employment growth. Now think about that. The more money that you can retain within your business, the faster it can grow, which means you might employ more people. And more importantly for the government, this means more tax income for them. So the main drawback to incorporating is that there's additional administrative cost and burden. Now the additional cost can include incorporation fees, annual corporate tax filing and legal filings, and more compliance, corporate documents, minute books, etc. On average, these extra costs will start around $3,500 in the first year as an incorporated business. You are bringing a new entity into the world after all. Plus, if you ever want to shut it down, you'll have additional costs there as well. 
Now for many business owners though, the benefits can outweigh those additional costs. Now these include limited liability. So incorporating allows for businesses to grow without personal liability. So that's a good thing. Two is lower tax rates. The business can claim the small business deduction, which gives it a lower tax rate on the first $500,000 of business income. So that's a good thing too. <laughs> Now, you can also access the lifetime capital gains exemption. Incorporating gives you access to this exemption, which allows you to sell your business at a gain of almost a million dollars without paying any tax. Next up is income splitting. The business can split income with family members who own shares in the company as long as they are involved in the business. This can result in significant tax savings. However, the government has put some restrictions on these in recent years. Accumulating wealth. Lower tax rates mean that it's easier for corporations to accumulate wealth inside the business, although the government has also put some restrictions on this. All right, lastly, income timing. Corporations also allow business owners to strategically take their income when it benefits them the most. Bonuses and dividends can be declared to delay paying taxes. Now that we understand the benefits of incorporating, the next question is, when should you incorporate your business? Now, I'll give you some common examples of when business owners might want to incorporate, but if you're interested in learning more, check for the video linked in the description below as we go through that in more detail there. Now, if you're concerned about limited liability, so that's the first one, incorporating might be the right move. If you're building a business that you plan to sell, incorporating gives you access to lifetime capital gains exemption when you do. Now, if the business also is earning more profit than you personally need to live off of, then incorporating can help you to defer and potentially save taxes. Now, one final note on incorporating. If you do decide to incorporate, don't half-ass it. We see lots of people incorporate their business only to negate any benefit by neglecting their bookkeeping and accounting. If you do not keep your records up to date, no tax planning is possible. Part of incorporating your business is hiring a great bookkeeper and accountant. It's an investment. I know that's very selfish of me to say that, but also I see the other side of it. I see people that come with years of a mess and there's no real help we can give them in tax planning. And if they just invested in that upfront, it would be a lot easier and more helpful and much more benefit for them. All right, so let's move on to the next level of tax planning that we'll discuss. And that's corporate structuring or the use of holding companies. Now, creating a holding company can be a great tax planning strategy to protect and build wealth under certain circumstances. As with incorporation overall, it's pretty low risk strategy. However, because it's more complex, you will face more administrative cost and burden. There are a few important benefits to using a holding company that I'll cover right now. All right, so number one, helping with asset protection. Operating companies are exposed to risk through their everyday business activities. Transferring some of the assets of an operating company to a holding company can provide a layer of protection in the event that creditors come after those assets. Two, helping you claim the lifetime capital gains exemption. The lifetime capital gains exemption provides owners of Canadian controlled private corporations with tax-free capital gains of up to $913,000. So nothing to sniff at. So to be eligible for the lifetime capital gains exemption, companies need to show that most of their assets are used in their regular business operations. If an operating company also holds a bunch of investments, this requirement might not be met. That's where a holding company can help. The operating company would transfer the investments to the holding company through a tax-free corporate dividend. Then the operating company can meet the requirement that most of its investments are used in the business operations and therefore eligible for the lifetime capital gains exemption. Next up is tax deferral from a holding company. A holding company provides flexibility around the timing of when income is earned and therefore taxed. And this is especially important where you have multiple shareholders. This creates some tax deferral opportunities for the owner of the business. So if you're interested in learning more about holding companies, check out our guide on holding companies. That's linked in the description below as well. Now, once you understand how they work, it's a good idea to reach out to a tax professional to help you structure things properly. These can get more complex. All right, so let's move up to level four, health insurance and life insurance. These can be handy tools for tax planning. However, we're starting to get up there in complexity and risk levels. The reason why we've rated this as higher risk is because the government has made some light indication that they may target health benefits for taxability in the future, but nothing has been brought forward yet. 
Life insurance policies already have limitations attached to them around deductibility of premiums, plus there is also the risk that government could target them for taxation in the future. It's important for business owners to understand that these tax planning strategies are out there though, and to be able to understand the basics of how they work as well. So health insurance. At the moment, health insurance can be a handy tool for tax planning. Health insurance plans make it easier to deduct medical expenses for owners and employees. It's a good way to provide benefits to your employees of the company, owners included, while ensuring that medical spend is tax deductible for the business as well. So it's kind of that win-win. It's deductible for the business and not taxable for the employee or the owner. So offering health insurance for your employees is also has the benefit of making it easier to attract talented workers to your business. So that's a good thing. Life insurance. Now, life insurance can be another tool for tax planning and wealth creation. It is especially important when it comes to estate planning. If a business owner wants to provide her children with a nest egg when she passes away, a life insurance policy can help with this. An example is the best way to describe this. So let's get into a little example here. Now, let's say Beth is the business owner and she has an incorporated business. Her company earns more money than Beth needs to live off of, so has excess money that the company is producing. And Beth would like to transfer cash from her company to her children when she passes away. Now, one way of doing this would be that Beth could just invest the funds and try to grow the cash available to her children when she passes. However, life insurance might be a better way to achieve her goals. Instead of holding investments directly within the holding company, Beth could have her corporation purchase a life insurance policy with those funds. The key to this strategy is that some forms of life insurance allow the policyholder to contribute additional funds over and above the monthly insurance premiums. Those funds are then invested in marketable securities that can grow tax-free within the insurance policy. In our example, Beth's company would buy the insurance policy and it would be the policyholder and the beneficiary. Now Beth would be the life assured, meaning that her life is what's insured by the company. What this all means is that the company pays for the insurance and gets the proceeds when Beth dies. When the life insurance policy is paid out to Beth's company upon her death, the payout is increased. This is because the investments were allowed to grow tax-free within the insurance policy. Now, Beth's children would then have a larger pool of money to inherit within the company. And if it's structured correctly, some of these funds can also be withdrawn tax-free from the company by Beth's children. One last note, up here in tax planning level four. Life insurance policies can be complex and the details can change from one policy to the next. So with more complex and riskier strategies, it's especially important to speak with professionals. If you wanna go this route, we recommend consulting with a tax accountant and an insurance broker who specializes in corporate life insurance policies. So there, disclaimer. <laughs> All right, so level five now, we're into it. So this involves tax havens and tax loopholes. We're now hitting expert plus level on tax planning and the lines can start to blur towards tax evasion, which most definitely is not legal. Now, if you've ever had the feeling that the uber rich play by a different set of rules, you're probably on the right track. As quickly as CRA closes loopholes, there are teams of professionals trying to discover and exploit new loopholes within the tax code. This in itself is not illegal. Lawyers and other tax professionals are completely within their rights to do so. But that doesn't mean that you, the small business owner, are able to access these loopholes. These would be tightly held secrets and offered only to those who stand to benefit and pay the most. They're constantly moving targets, so unless you're able to keep a tax lawyer on speed dial, they probably aren't for you. Besides, even if you do get away with it for a while, it can most definitely catch up with you. So check out the link in the description below for a story of Canadian millionaires dodging taxes with the help of a prominent accounting firm and how it caught up with them in the end. All right, so the good news for Canadian business owners is that the first four strategies are completely viable. Now that you have an understanding and an awareness of these tax planning strategies, you can talk with your accountant about implementing them and saving some tax. If you hear of other tax planning strategies that you'd like us to discuss, please leave a comment below. We're happy to discuss them, add context, or debunk any tax myths. We enjoy doing that as well. So if you've enjoyed this video or it's been helpful for you, please hit the like button. We really appreciate that. And if you like content like this or a small business owner in Canada yourself, please consider subscribing. We really like seeing that number creep up. It's absolutely amazing to see. But we really appreciate all the support that we've been getting and all the questions too and comments. So thank you. Keep those coming. Makes us feel good and keeps us motivated. So thanks again and we'll see you in the next video. Cheers.